With that, um, who is taking the lead this afternoon for the debtors? Mr. Basta, are you starting this off? If it works for the court, I'd like to walk the court through a pre brief overview of the company and why we're here and what we need to do to get out of here as quickly as possible. And I'm sure the court will hear from the other key parties in interest. And then Mr. Pimple will move our evidence in and proceed to cash collateral and the rest of the agenda. All right, so here we go. So who we are, we are National Cinema Media LLC. We are the largest cinema advertising network in North America. We're structured as an upsea, so an entity called National Cinema Media Inc. We all going to refer to generally as Inc. is a public company and it manages National Cinema Media LLC, the debtor, through a management agreement. And the senior executives are executives of Inc. We derive our revenue from the sale of advertising through various mediums. We have access to over 20,000 screens and over 1,500 theaters in 195 markets. In 22, more than 394 million people attended theaters in our network, which is more than 72% of the audience in the top 10 markets in the United States and 60% of the audience in the top 50 markets in the United States. This slide, Your Honor, just describes the mediums through which we provide advertising. There's on-screen advertising, primarily through the movie pre-show. There's advertising that appears in the lobby. There's digital online advertising, and there's digital out-of-home advertising. The company began in 2005. Our founding members, Regal, AMC, and Cinemark, formed a joint venture to launch this advertising platform. And they did so to better compete with television and other national networks and to try to grow their advertising revenue. And the agreements that are the foundation of the relationship are called exhibitor services agreements. And those exhibitor services agreements, you're going to hear a lot about them in this case, but they provide the debtor with the exclusive ability to access these networks and, 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 and allow our advertising to be um, aired on these networks. In 2007, the founding members did a very significant restructuring of the business. They formed Inc., they did an IPO, and they raised substantial amounts of debt, and they pocketed a billion five in payments in 2007. 686, for $686 million, the debtors purchased exclusivity, and for $770 million, they redeemed their old preferred unit. The 2007 deal extended the terms of these exhibitor services agreements, or ESAs, to 2037, they extended our exclusivity and non-competition rights and guaranteed them to the debtor. They provide us with the exclusive right to show NCM advertisements in exchange for theater access fees and for dividend distribution. And importantly, if the founding members acquired additional theaters in the future, they were bound to our agreement and had to fit within our network. The exhibitor services agreement are one of six key agreements that are the foundations of, of this business. The second agreement is called the Common Unit Adjustment Agreement, and this is a ratchet mechanism. And what the founding members did is, is to basically say, as, as, as to each other, they would grow or provide access to greater consumers, their rateable ownership of the LLC would adjust proportionately up or down based upon increases or decreases in theater attendance at their theaters. There's a tax receivables agreement, and under that tax receivables agreement, Inc. and NCM have to pay to the founding members 90% of the tax benefit that they receive from the founding members for tax attributes that are created from the transactions with the founding members. The LLC agreement covers governance, 75% of our business is with the founding members. The rest of the business is with network theater partners, and we have 45 agreements with other theater change. Change Those are structured differently. Instead of paying theater access fees, there's a, there's a revenue sharing formula for these other 45 
agreements. And there's a management of services agreement, which is the up fee agreement, which is how Inc. manages the debt. This is a picture. Oh, it's not. That's not the picture. This is the picture. This is a picture of our capital structure, and it's not very complicated. Starting on the left side, you see NCM Inc. And George Davis and Suzanne Euland from Latham are counsel to Inc. They also are proposed 327E counsel because they've been handling our litigation with Regal, which I'll cover towards the end of my presentation. NCM Inc. and a sub-LLC own all of the member interests in debtor. We are proposed as counsel with Porter Hedges, and you can see Lazard and FTI and Latham here on the page. There's $924 million of Perry Passu secured debt in the various instruments that are on the page. And that debt trades in the market at 30 cents on the dollar. There's $230 million of unsecured notes that trade for less than two cents on the dollar. Our primary creditor group that we have been working with constructively is represented by Gibson Dunn and Centerview, and I'm sure you'll hear from them today on the call. You can see that it's a very significant group. They own more than 70% of the 2018 and revolving loans. They own 86% of the 2022 revolving loans. They own 70% of the secured notes and 34% of the unsecured notes. So how did we end up in Chapter 11? It's not going to be a surprise to your honor. The COVID-19 pandemic had a very significant impact on the business. And even when we started to come out of the pandemic late in 2020, advertising revenue continued to decline just because theater attendance continued to decline. And in 2021 and 22, even when government regulations subsided, the continuation of COVID variants continued to deter attendance at theaters. We estimate that we lost approximately $850 million to $1 billion in revenue as a result of COVID-19. The company did not sit on its hands. It significantly reduced payroll-related costs. It obtained a new $50 million revolver, which was fully drawn. And most recently, we were able to get a few extensions of the grace period on our unsecured notes so we could continue working with Mr. Greenberg and Mr. Chopra at Centerview to try to work out the terms of an RSA. The company was proactive in making sure that appropriate governance protocols were in place. In January of 23, at the Inc. level, Inc. created what they call a Capital Structure Review Committee and began negotiations with the Gibson Centerview group. And then in March of this year, Inc. appointed Carol Slayton as an independent manager of the debtor to handle any conflict issues between Inc. I think Ms. Slayton is on the Zoom somewhere. Our efforts were successful. We reached a restructuring support agreement, which we signed last night with holders of more than 67% of our secured debt and with Inc. The goal of the restructuring support agreement is twofold. We wanted to restructure and deliver, and we wanted to preserve our ability to assume the agreements that are critical to the reorganization of the business. To go through the terms of the RSA, it's a complete equitization of the secured debt. As for case funding, we don't think we need debt financing. We're projecting sufficient cash to administer the Chapter 11. We plan to assume all of our ESAs on the plan effective date. There is a 9019 settlement with Inc. where we are going to maintain the UPSI structure and continue all of our performance obligations on all of our agreements with the founding members. Inc. is going to contribute $15 million of cash on the plan effective date, and it's going to take all necessary corporate actions to successfully 
uh, implement all of these restructurings, and in exchange for that, it's going to receive 13.8% of the equity in the reorganized NCN. This deal with Inc. It goes a long way to, uh, um, to pave the way for us to name the ESAs and all of our agreements with our counterparty. So the equity split is 86.2 and 13.8. In the event, at the end of the case, we need, uh, we, we need exit financing and we can't get it in the market, we will get it from our ad hoc group of lenders. We did something novel, some might say heavy-handed, on uh, with respect to the treatment of the uh, general unsecured creditors and the bonds. What the RSA says is if there's no creditors committee, the general unsecured creditors are going to get paid in full. And if there's no creditors committee, there'll be a distribution to the bonds that trades at less than two cents. But there's real reasons why we did this. And so I'm going to go to the next page, which is going to give the court the map, and I hope the court understands why we've laid it out this way. We asked, you know, Lazard and FDI to turn up their brain volume and put together this very sophisticated analysis. And what it shows is that we have $27.8 million of general and secure claims. Today we're seeking authority to pay $3.8 million as critical vendor payments. The estimated cure amounts are $21.6 million. So we estimate the general unsecured class to be $2.4 million in this case. If we get a creditors committee, we anticipate the cost of the creditors committee, if you look at what's been going around, at a, a, to be more than $10 million. We would prefer just to pay the general unsecured creditors $2.4 million than to pay administrative expenses of $10 million, and if we have to pay administrative expense uh, amounts of $10 million, that will not only crunch our liquidity, but it will be make it very difficult for us to get the secured creditors to pay to the actual client. So we understand that this is not a decision within our control. We understand we're not trying to tell the United States trustee what to do. The United States trustee will do what it needs to do uh, 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 to, uh, to make this work from their perspective, but we're just pointing out the math to everybody that we think the practical solution here is to keep this not-so-complicated case simple and to get the dollars into the hands of the creditors. Certainly. And, and I'm assuming, and, and I know that we're on less than 24 hours notice, but I'm going to guess, and I agree with you, the U.S. trustee can do what the U.S. trustee can do under the statute, but I'm going to bet you there's probably a stipulation or agreed order that could give them a lot of comfort uh, going forward, but I'll leave that, I'll leave that to you all to work through. Yes, I think we could do that, uh, absolutely, and we will reach out on that on that topic. 